In this class, we are going to talk about goroutines. Goroutines can be considered lightweight threads that can run concurrently with other parts of the program. Think of them as individual tasks or jobs that can be performed simultaneously. The advantage of using goroutines is that they are extremely efficient and lightweight. You can create thousands of goroutines without a significant impact on memory usage or performance. They are managed by the GoRuntime, which automatically schedules and distributes them across available processor cores. Let's start our first example here. I'm going to print a message in the console. Let's run our program and see the output. So right now we have the message done. Instead of calling the println function, I will be creating a new function that will uh, receive a string parameter and will print it. Now, instead of calling println, I'm going to call my new function. So this, this will be the same result as before without changes. Okay, but let's say that we want to print more than one message like this. One, two, three, four. So running the application, we see the messages uh, ordered and we will introduce the goroutine right now. So we are going to use this keyword go and call the function after this. So this will be executing these print messages asynchronously. But when we execute the program, we don't see the output of the first four messages. And this is happening because this here is the main go routine, our main thread. And this thread is not giving enough time to the other functions to be executed. So in order to hold a little the main thread, we will have to put here a time slip. I will be sleeping for one second and we will see that this will be enough to execute the other go routines. Now that we have enough time, we see that all the go routines are printing in the console. Cool. Uh, I will be increasing a little the number of messages here just to uh, show you another thing. So let's iterate in this print message function. Uh, five times. Okay, and let's execute this way. So uh, one thing that's important to notice here is that we don't have order, the same order happening, because the goroutines are executing in a, a synchronous way. We can't handle uh, them in this example. We can't handle order. We don't know which one will be executed first or last. A uh, good example of this would be creating a new goroutine in after the main print message. This is a anonymous function. Uh, so I will print something here, something else. And we are going to notice in the in the console that this will not be the last message being printed, but instead one of the firsts. So it's clear for us that we don't have much control on the order here, but we can execute a bunch of different stuff asynchronously. That's it for the GoRoutines class. I hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next class. A mutex in Go uh, is used to control access to a shared resource in concurrent programming. Uh, it prevents multiple goroutines to modify the shared data simultaneously. So right here, we are going to create a problem. We are going to create a goroutine and we are going to change a variable inside of it. Let's increment that and let's print that. So, 
The first problem here is that we are not going to see the correct value of the variable. Uh, because this is happening because the guroutine didn't have time to finish before the program finishes. So let's wait a little in the main program and see whether the guroutine will have time or not to finish. Uh, now we see that, yeah, uh, it had time to finish before the main thread. Uh, let's increment our problem. Let's create a huger problem here. Uh, I'm going to create uh, 1000 routines and I will change the count variable uh, in each go routine. So now we have a different problem. We will notice that every time that we run the program, we have, we got a different value. So you may think that we did the thread, we did not have time to finish, but we are going to see that this is not a problem of waiting, but let's print inside of the go routine and see what is happening there. Let's print it again. So as you can notice, a lot of go routines is changing the variable at the same time, which is causing uh, this uh, behavior like here, a lot of 32 uh, values. So we want to prevent that. We don't want the go routines to change at the same time the count variable. So let's solve that using mutex. So we have this variable now from the sync package, and now we will lock and unlock in the end of the function. And that's it. We are going to notice that we will have order now. I will keep the slip. So now you can notice that we have order. Each goroutine is changing the variable in a different uh, time. So we have 1000 goroutines changing the variable one at a time. That's what Butex does. It protects uh, that specific uh, piece of code, a section of code. It protects this section uh, and it assures that one goroutine is not racing against each other. That's it. In this class, we are going to learn about condition variables in Go. So, they are used to coordinate the execution of goroutines based on certain conditions. So, associated with Mutex, uh, they allow goroutines to wait for a condition to become true or to be notified when a condition changes. It will be easier to understand from the code. So, I will create two new functions here, uh, one called producer and another one called consumer. We will need some variables here also. So let's create a counter and a mutex. And we will also have the condition variable. So the condition variable uses this function called new cond from the new cond from the sync package. And in this function, we will pass the mutex as a pointer. So the condition variable, it works together with the mutex. For now, I will be commenting this, so uh, we'll explain it later. So I implement uh, the producer here. Let's keep it simple by now. Let's just increment the variable here and counter. Okay, counter. And let's decrement the variable here. I will call both using the go routine. And I will wait for some seconds. So 
So let's see how it's going to behave. Uh, you know what? Let's let's add some time sleep here in the producer and in the consumer, so we can see it uh, easier. It's gonna be easier to see that in the console. Okay, now we are waiting uh, one second and bring in the variable. Uh, yeah, we don't expect that to work. <laughs> we will see a lot of uh, a mess in the console. Uh, so let's try to make it clear in the messages so we can see uh, which, which function is, it's changing the variable. So this is the incrementing and this other one, the decrementing. Okay, now let's run again. Yeah, so now we see uh, that's not working. We see that's incrementing at first, then decrementing twice and then incrementing uh, twice. So it's not working. Uh, Okay, we are not using mutex here. Let's use mutex and see if we can see a better results. So, you know, the deal here is we have to lock and unlock the section of code. So we can assure that each function will change the variable counter uh, at a time. Yeah. Now we have a, a better result, but still seeing twice decrementing, twice incrementing, and not, a, not any order. So, because mutex is not for that. Mutex is only to protect the resources when the functions are changing them, so we can assure that they are not changing at the same time. But we can add some logic using the condition variable and make sure that we have an order. So, in the producer, I will uh, add a if condition here. And when the counter uh, is greater than zero, I will be waiting. So this is the function that we use to hold. And I will do the opposite here in the consumer. So when it's equal zero, yes, I will be waiting. We also have to add a signal function using the cond variable. And what it does, it sends a signal to the waiting uh, condition variable. So it's gonna release, it's gonna stop waiting. Let's run. Okay, it looks like it worked. Perfect, let's run again so we can assure it. Yeah, perfect. Uh, let's do a little review on what what is working here. So we have the producer and the consumer being called and the counter is zero when it starts. So as it is zero, it's not gonna to attend this condition. So it's gonna be incremented at first, but in the consumer, it's gonna be waiting because it's, it is zero. So this waiting is happening. So after the change, the consumer will, uh, the producer will unlock the thread and the consumer will have the signal, will receive the signal and will release this part of the code. So the counter will be, will be decreased. As it will be decreased, we are going to release and then the producer that was uh, waiting will now uh, increase again the variable. So that's it. Uh, that's a good example of how to use conditional variables uh, with mutex. And I hope you like it. See you next class.
In this class, we are going to talk about weight groups. In Go, a weight group is a synchronization mechanism provided by the sync package. It allows you to wait for a group of Go routines to finish their execution and then proceed. We are going to create a problem and after that we will solve it using weight groups. Let's go. So I'm going to create a problem that we've seen a lot so far. Uh, we have this count variable, some Go routines, a lot of them, and we will change this variable inside of this Go routines. So let's make it 100 and then create Go routines inside of this loop. Okay, let's print it. Print. Okay. Now, uh, when running these, we I'm sure that we are going to receive zero because I remember. Uh, the main thread uh, finished before the goroutine had time to finish. So uh, we have to do something. And you, what we usually do is that we, we create a time sleep. And then let's give it a second to finish. OK, now uh, we have this 90, 99 because we are not using mutex. I think that one second it's enough to finish, but we have to use mutex to assure that they are changing the variable correctly without racing. Okay, now we have 100 and that's it. But we have a problem. Uh, we are waiting one second. So let's remove this time slip here. What's going to happen? We will see zero because we don't have time. Uh, so let's increase the far. Yeah, it looks like it's working, but let's increase it more. Now we have one 10,000. Still enough. Oh, this is fast. <laughs> Let's see the limit of one second. Okay. Okay, finally. So we got to the point that one second is not time, not enough time to run uh, one hundred thousand go routines there. And what about five seconds? Yeah, it's enough. So uh, the problem that we create here is that uh, we we can't tell the amount of time that the goroutines will take to finish. So we, we, we will not be experimenting every single algorithm. And maybe if we increase too much the time, we will be uh losing the ability to finish the program as soon as possible so this is not good but we still don't need weighted groups to solve this specific problem uh, we can use conditional variables in order to wait in the main thread uh, and then release it let's see so i'm gonna create the condition variable And now we'll use the new count function, passing the mutex as a pointer. OK. So I will remove the time sleep, and then I will lock and unlock this main thread. Good. Now let's put some logic here. I will wait until the count variable uh, be 
100,000. Let's put it in a variable here. So here I'm going to wait and then, yeah, that's it. Mm, yeah, racing. No, what's happening here? Okay, I have to send this signal to the condition variable. I, I forgot about it. I'll say after unlocking the thread, I will send the signal and then I'm going to release this weight. Let's see now. Okay, now it works. Good. Let's increase this value here. I don't know, it seemed like something 10 millions, I don't know. Yeah, it's gonna wait until all the go routines finished and then we'll uh, release the the weight in the condition now, condition variable. Now we have an additional problem here. You see this function right here? We are not considering this function as one of the go routines. Uh, so we are waiting, but we are not waiting for this go routine. So let's say that we have here something like a very have algorithm. Then, um, yeah, let's let's time sleep it. I'll have to decrease this. It will take too much time. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Let's let's run. Let's test. Okay, I was expecting an error. Oh. Okay, you know what? Um, let's print something. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I wanted, kind of. Uh, the this routine is not finishing because it doesn't have time to finish. Let's see. Yeah, exactly. So when we were waiting in the time sleep. It wasn't finishing, and when we stopped waiting, it finished. I will I will be working around it, still using condition variables. I will try to increase this, and I will have to decrease in the garrotin. Okay, I have to use mutex. I'm changing the shared resource, so. Let's see. Mm. Nope. Let's try a different approach here. Invert the logic. Okay. Uh, yeah. This signal is missing. We have to inform the weight that it can be released. And now we got it. Yeah, so it took a while, but now we have the condition variable waiting for the main thread. Even that we had to have an algorithm there. But as you can see, it's kind of verbose. Let's make it worst. 
let's say that we have a different go route in here with uh, different a number of iterations. And we will have to add these other iterations to the logic. Yeah, it's getting. And we have to add one more because, yeah, the uh, main coroutine. So, yeah, this is not good. It's going to work. Uh, I'm quite sure that's going to work, but this is not good because it's not only variables, but this, it's hard to maintain. Okay, it worked. Good. Uh, now that you know the problem and how bad it is to use condition variables to control this, we will finally use the weighted group to control that flow. So I will command that just to make it clear for us the number of things that we are avoiding just using the correct uh, approach. So let's remove this and add the weight group from the sync package. Uh, we have two approaches here. The first is we, we can add to the eight group all the iterations at once, like this. Let's reproduce that here also. And yeah, as we have this other function and it, it will, we will have to wait until it's done. So we will add these two functions here uh, to the weight group. And then in the end of the code, we will uh, wait for the weight group to be done. Uh, but we have also to mark each a function as done in the end. So here, also here, and also in the main function, not the main function, the main go routine. So all of them are marked now as done in the end of the functions. Uh, that's it. This is the first approach. Um, we are adding all the iterations to the weighted group, and then we are marking them as done in the end of the functions. And waiting, waiting in the uh, end of the main thread. Let's wait. Okay, so as you can see, uh, it's the same behavior as we uh, we got before. Let's remove this commentary here so we can make it clearer. Yeah, cool. But we're still adding the iterations uh, at once. So let's do that in a different way. Uh, easier approach here would be adding uh, to the weight group the number one in the beginning of each go routine, like this. So before the go routine to be started, we will add one at the weight group. And then we are going to defer the weight group done function uh, in the beginning of the go routine. So this way uh, it's more readable. So we remove this. And we put this in the beginning of the go routine. Yeah, let's do the same here. And here. Yeah, so this approach is way easier to read. Uh, we are basically adding one uh, before each go routine and in the beginning of the go routine we are uh, calling the don uh, function from the weight group. Uh, so th this way we we can assure that we are not forgetting to mark any go routine as done. Uh, 
Uh, cool. Uh, let's run that. We are waiting the end here. Looks good. Let's run. The results should be the same. Uh, we only changed the approach. Okay, same results. Um, and let's create a new routine here with other iterations. And yeah, so same thing. Let, let's put here three. Uh, so you're, you're going to see that it's way easier to maintain this approach because you just have to remember to add and to mark each goroutine as done. Uh, the results will be pretty much the same, uh, except uh, except that we have a new message. Okay, looking good. So we have everything in place, and that's it for the weight groups class. Uh, yeah, we are going to see more real examples on how to use mutexes, condition variables and weight groups in the coming class. So uh, so we can have a, a better idea on how to use these structures, uh, these tools in the real world. Thank you for that and see you in the next class. In this class, we are going to talk about atomic operations. In Go, atomic operations refer to operations that are performed atomically which means they are indivisible and can't be interrupted by other concurrent operation. In many cases, they can replace the use of mutex and deliver a most efficient, performatic and less variables code. We will see that they are used for simple operations in variables, as for example, changing or retrieving values. These operations are designed to prevent data races and ensure synchronization when multiple goroutines assess the same variable simultaneously. So now that we have a good knowledge about the use of mutex, I decided to brought this uh, already done example here to make it easier for us to understand where we are going and to make a comparison between the atomic operations and the mutex. So let's go. So we are iterating here 1000 times in this far, and then we are creating go routines inside of this. Uh, in each of these go routines, we are incrementing the variable count. And in order to do that securely, we are locking and deferring to unlock uh, in the end of the function. So we are unlocking. And yeah, we have this differ function here that's also marking the weight group as done. Uh, in the end of the main thread, we have the weight group waiting uh, for the weight groups to be done. And we are printing the variable count uh, as the last action. Let's run this program and see the results. As you can see, we have always the 1000. It's perfectly working, but let's remove the mutex from this approach. And we know what's going to happen. Now that we don't have the mutex, uh, the variable will not be changed in a secure way. Each goroutine is going to change it concurrently. So we have to use mutex in this case. So let's uncomment what we've done here and let's start talking about how to do this using atomic operations instead of mutexes. Let's remove the mutex from our code and I'll be running the program again just to us to see the problem again. So. And then let's add atomic operations in this count variable. So the first atomic operation that we are going to use here is to add an integer in the variable. As you can see in these functions, we have inter integer 32 and 64. So we're going to change the 
primitive type of the count variable to integer 32. Then we will use the function add int 32. And this function will receive two parameters. The first one is the address of the count variable. So it has to be a pointer. And the second parameter is the delta that will be added to the pointer. In this case, we want to add only one. Also, uh, this function will return a value, uh, which we are not going to use right now, uh, but we could uh, use it if we wanted. Yeah, so we have a new value being returned, but we don't want to use that right now. We don't need to use that in our code here. Uh, we also have to use atomic operations when reading or loading values from this uh, shared resource. So we are going to use the atomic dot atomic array atomic dot load integer 32. Same thing, we have to pass the address of the variable as a pointer. And the function will be returning the value, uh, the current value of the variable. That's it. We are uh, assuring that the variable is changing inside of these 1000 go routines without racing. Uh, and it's it's how we use atomic operations instead of mutex in this kind of uh, operation. We have an additional way to use atomic operations in Go that's not calling the atomic package directly. Instead of using the primitive type integer 32 in the variable, we can use a type from the atomic package. Inter integer 32 struct will have some functions, the same functions we were using, and we can use this directly in the code. So instead of calling this, we will call the count variable and use the function add. That's in the delta. That's it. And instead of loading this way, we will load the variable using itself. So load. So this way we are not using an integer 32 variable and using atomic operations, but instead we are using an atomic variable uh, and calling atomic functions. The results will be pretty much the same. Now, how this is better or worse than mutexes? So basically, uh, let's try a different stuff here. Let's say that we want to print this variable inside of these go routines right here. This is going to introduce a new problem for us. Yeah, we are loading the variable, that's an atomic variable, and let's see the results. So, as you can see, our program is again racing. But why? The fact is that the println function from the FMT package is not an atomic function. And this is the, a problem when it comes to atomic variables. This is not an atomic operation. So if we want to do that uh, in a correct way, we will have to use mutex again. So we would have to lock the thread and to unlock in the end of the function. Let's run again. So this is going to work. What I'm trying to uh, explain here to you is that if we want to use atomic operations, we have to get rid of complexity in our code. So I gave you the example of the println function, uh, but it could be any other operation that's more complex than retrieving or adding value to a variable. Uh, so if we want to use atomic operations, we have to make our code as simple as possible in order to achieve this. 
We could also use atomic operations to change more complex values, not only integers or booleans. In this example, we are going to use a struct called person. And inside of this struct, we will have two fields, the name and the age of the person. When assigning this struct to a value, we will use an atomic value. So from the atomic package, we have this value struct. Right here, we will initiate our person inside of the atomic value variable. So we can use the function star and it receives an interface or a any value. So we will put here our person. I'm gonna call my name and my current age. So let's say that we want to change the age of this person inside of the go routines without racing, of course. Uh, yeah, first of all, let me clean up a little this code here. I'm going to remove this count variable that we are not going to use anymore. And I'll also get rid of this defer function here because, uh, yeah, we don't need this. Let me just defer the weight group done. So it's going to be clearer for us to understand. Now, the way we change the person using atomic operations, we have first to load the person to a variable. So using the person atomic variable, we can use the load function, but this is a any function return. So we will have to cast the result of this to a person. So the way we do that, uh, it's a simple cast in Go. We are gonna cast to person. Another point here, uh, and I just noticed that, is that we are not using uh, a pointer when storing the person up there. So remember, when using atomic operations, we have to use pointers. This is the way it works. Now that I loaded the person uh, in the P variable, I'm going to change its age. And in order to do that correctly, we have to use atomic operations. So let's call atomic and let's add one to this age. Remember, we have to pass it as a pointer and then the delta that's going to be added. OK, looking good. Uh, let's print our person in the end of the program. Okay, let's run it. Yeah, so this is the address. Oh, okay. Remember, we have to use atomic operations. We have to load the atomic value and we have to cast it. Yeah, now we see that the age was increased 10 times and it's 45 right now without raising. Let's increase it here. Yeah, so it's adding 1000 to the age. Uh, and okay yeah looks good this is uh what i wanted to show you in terms of changing more complex uh, types using atomic operations so we were not only able to change the person uh, value but also we were able to change a uh, property inside of the struct So this is it for the atomic operation class. I hope you enjoy it and see you in the next class. In this class, we are going to talk about pool. The pool type in Go provides a simple object pool that can be used to store and reuse objects, reducing the overhead of memory allocation and garbage collection. It's especially useful for managing frequently allocated and short-lived objects. The pool type has two main methods, get and put. When you call get, 
it checks if there are any objects available in the pool. If there is an object available, it returns that object. If the pool is empty, it calls the new function, if provided, to create a new object and returns it. When you are done using an object obtained from the pool, you should call put to return the object back to the pool. This allows the pool to reuse the object for subsequent calls to get, reducing the need of creating new objects. Any item stored in the pool may be removed automatically at any time without notification, and a pool is safe for use by multiple goroutines simultaneously. A good example of the use of pools would be handling database connections. So, let's say that we have a struct here called DB connection, and let's leave it without fields. Um, let's say that we want to use this database connection inside of our main thread. So, when it comes to database connections, we usually open and close them as we use them. And let's say that we have more than one goroutines using uh, that database connection. So we don't want them to concurrently close and open connections. So in this case, a pool is a very good approach. I'm gonna create a bunch of goroutines here, and then we will initiate the DB connection struct instead of each of them. By now, let's just print the connection in our code. Okay, we have to wait in the main thread so we can wait until the goroutine is to execute. Okay, we have the connections in the console, but let's make a way to differentiate them. So I'm gonna add this index and I will increment this count variable every time that we start or initiate a new connection. So let's use an atomic operation here. Okay, I will change this variable to integer32. And oh, let's run again. Okay. Now we have 10 different connections being created inside of the goroutines. So imagine that we have uh, database operations running inside of each of these goroutines. So we would have 10 different connections being created. So now we could improve that using pool. I will declare this new variable here called connection pool, and we will call a pointer in the sync package in the struct called pool. Inside of this struct, we will uh, implement the method called new. Uh, this new method will return the object that we desire. In our case, we will return the DB connection with an incremental index. So I will still use atomic operations and increment the count variable every time that we call the new. Now I will remove this and I will call the get. There are some important points here. The first is that the get function has no relation with the put function. So it doesn't mean uh, if you are getting, it doesn't mean that you are getting the object that was put right before the get. Uh, we will understand that uh, further. Another important point is that if we have the new function implemented, as we have, get will return the value of the new if the pool is empty. Maybe it will be clearer after we run our example. So I will only print the connection uh, as it was an operation, and I will uh, put back the object com to our pool. And that's it. Let's run our program. Something wrong here. Let me check. 
okay, we have to return a pointer in the new function. That's it. Okay, now we, we got it. And as we can notice here, we have already some repetition. So if you observe well, we have one being printed twice, four being printed more than one time. So this means that some of the connections were reused and we are potentially saving resources, CPU, memory, network, throughput. I will add some time sleep here in the middle of the guillotines and also in the bottom of the for loop so we can uh, debug this behavior easier. Okay. So now that we are sleeping in the middle of the goroutines, we can easily notice that uh, the connections are being reused by the code. So we have one, two, three, and then one again, and three after that. And that's the behavior that we want. We are uh, using the connections uh, from the pool as they are available, which will not happen if I remove the put because right now we are not putting back the objects uh, into the pool. So it's important to understand that we have to use the object. And after the use, in this case, we are only printing, we have to put the object back. And our example is running correctly again. Uh, there is one last thing that I have to mention, and I couldn't find a way to demonstrate that in this class but I, I did mention in the beginning. Every time that we are using pool, we are creating and using and putting back objects in that pool, but we don't have much control on how much time each object will uh, be there. So any item stored in the pool uh, may be removed automatically and we don't have control of that. So this is something that's hard to show here, but it's worth it to mention. That's it for the pool class and see you in the next class. In this class, we are going to talk about channels. Channels in Go are fundamental feature of the language that provide a way for goroutines to communicate and synchronize with each other. A channel is a conduit or pipe through which data can be sent and received. It acts as a synchronization point, ensuring that sending and receiving operations are coordinated between goroutines. So what we are going to see is basically this. Let's say that we have two goroutines and we want to exchange messages between them. To do that, we create a channel. So the sender goroutine sends a value to the channel and the receiver goroutine receives from it. We will learn further in this class that goroutines can be blocked and unblocked depending on the type of the channel that can be buffered or unbuffered. We will also see that we can have multiple goroutines connected to the channel, receiving messages from it and also sending messages to it. Let's dive into the code and understand better these concepts. As our very first example, we are going to code exactly what we've drew in our diagram. So we will have this sender function and we will also have a receiver. Both of them are guru teams. So we want to send a message from this goroutine and receive it in this other goroutine. The way we do that is creating a channel. This is the way we create a channel. We use the function make and we say the type of the channel. It's important to mention that this is a unbuffered channel, but we will see that further. Now we will send a message to the channel. So in the sender go routine, we use that send operator. So this is the way we send messages into the channel. And in the receiver, we will use the 
receive operator, which is the same but located on the left of the channel. And we are going to print our message variable with the value from the channel. We should also block our main thread here so we can wait until both go routine to execute. Let's run it. Okay, so we have the message. Let's change this message. <laughs> message one, two, three, something like. Okay, and then run again. So we are sending a message in the first routine and receiving it in the second one. It is important to say that the declaration order here doesn't matter. We can have the receiver being declared first and the sender after, and it will not be a problem in terms of results. Let's also put a time slip in this sender so we can see things in a more debuggable way. Uh, so the receiver will be waiting, but the sender will wait some a second until it sends the message. Let's run it. Okay, as you can see, it delayed one second and then it sent the message. So this is our very first example. Let's go for the next one. This example is similar to the previous one, except that we are going to zoom in into the possibilities when it comes to channels. So we will have two functions, the sender function and the receiver function. Same as before, but we are creating separate functions in this example. Here we are going to add the channel as a parameter in the sender function. And I'm going to introduce to you a new concept. Here we will say that this channel is a send only channel. We do that using the send operator right after the chain reserved word. This means that if we try to read the message from this specific channel, we are going to receive an error. So it says that cannot receive from send only channel. This is a way for us to assure that this channel and this specific function will only be used to send messages. The opposite is also true, so we can have a channel parameter that is a receive only channel. We are using the receive operator right before the chain reserved word. And as you can see, we are not able to send messages because it is a receive only channel. Again, this is a very good way to make sure that we are using correctly the channels. Now in the main function, we will create our channel, our string channel, and I will call the sender function and the receiver function, of course, using the go routines. I will also block the main thread so we can see the results in the console. Let's also implement our functions. I will at first send a single message into the channel. And receive the same message printing in the receiver. Let's run this and see the results. Okay, this is basically what we've seen in the previous example. So let's make it different. Instead of sending only one message to the channel, let's create a loop and send a few more messages. So here we will use the send operator and send a message to our channel. I will use in sprint fee function here just to enumerate the messages so we can differentiate 
one message to the other. Okay. Now that we have more than a single message being sent to the channel, we have to read from it. The way we do that is using a for statement and ranging the channel. This way, we are going to read the messages from the channel in an uninterrupted way. So a quick review, we are sending messages in this routine, which is sending five messages, and we are reading from the channel in the receiver function. Let's run our program. We have five messages in the console, which looks good. And let's put a time slip in the receiver function so we can follow the messages being printed. Let's run again the program. And as you can see, we have a delay, but we have the messages being delivered in the console and everything looks good. But what happens if I add one more receiver in our code. So let's see this behavior. As you can notice, we have two messages being read at the same time. And if I add an additional group in here, we will see three. This means that we can have multiple goroutines reading from the same channel. The number of messages received didn't change but we could observe a way faster reading from the channel. Now, the opposite is also true. We could have more than one routine sending messages. So in this case, we would have 15 messages being sent and three receiver goroutines reading them. If we inspect this console, we are going to see three times the message two, three times the message four, and three times the message three, and three times the message one. So the number of messages delivered are correct. Let's go for our next example. In this example, we are going to see that we can use channels not only to exchange messages between goroutines, but also to synchronize them. So I'll create a channel of boolean and I will block the main thread using the receive operator. So as it is a unbuffered channel, it's going to block the main thread. Then I will create a goroutine and inside of this goroutine I'm going to time slip zero. So we can debug that. Okay, two seconds. And then I will send a message using the send operator to the channel. So this will unblock the DON. And I will print a message that the main thread was unblocked. Let's run our example and see the results. So as you could observe, uh, after two seconds, we sent a message to the channel and then the main thread was unblocked. Then we saw the message in the console. There are a few more ways to synchronize goroutines using context, for example, but this is subject for another class. In this example, we are going to see the differences between unbuffered and buffered channels. I'll create this string channel and I will send a message into this channel right after the creation of it. As simple as that, let's run our program and see the results. We got an error in the console and it says that it is a deadlock in the line seven. So the problem here is that when we send a message to a channel, we are blocking the thread. And in this case, we are blocking the main thread. We will see the same behavior if we try to read from this channel. So I'll try to print uh, the value from this channel 
and we will see an error again. Because this time I'm trying to read from a channel in the main thread and as it is a unbuffered channel, it is blocking the go routine. If we want to send and receive messages to our channels without blocking it, we should use buffered channels. To do that, we have to say the size of the channel in the make function. Let's run our program this way and see the results. So, as you can notice, we don't have any more the deadlock message in the console. Let's try to print our value from the channel using the receive operator. Okay, let's run. So, as you can see, we were able to send a message to the channel and read from the channel right after it without any errors. Now, what is going to happen if I have another message being sent to the channel? The problem here is that the channel at this point is full because we have a channel of the size of one. Let's run it this way and see what we got. We have again the deadlock message in the line 10, oh, sorry, in the line 12 because we are trying to send a message to a already full channel. The same thing will happen if we try to read from a channel that's already empty. Let's see. Okay, we have now in the line 14, the same error, that luck error, because we are trying to read from a already empty channel. The way we solve that is uh, increasing the size of our channel, and then we will be able to send more messages and to read more messages from the same channel. Let's run and see the results. Okay, everything looks good. So by concept, we can say the following about buffered channels. Buffered channels have a specific capacity greater than zero. They can hold a certain number of values without blocking the sender. It will only block the sender if the buffer is full. Similarly, it will only block the receiver if the buffer is empty. That's it for the channels class. I hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next class. In this class, we are going to talk about the SELECT statement. The SELECT statement in Go is used to handle multiple channel operations concurrently. It allows you to wait for one or more channels to become ready for communication and then perform the corresponding operations. By utilizing the SELECT statement effectively, you can write robust and efficient concurrent code in Go allowing good routines to communicate and synchronize seamlessly. Let's say that we have some sender good routines. Remember, it can be multiple good routines. And we have some channels. Let's make it three. Listening to these channels, we have a select statement. And inside of the select statement, we have some casey blocks one KZ block for each channel. The sender go routines are independently sending values to the channels. The select listens to all channels and forwards the messages to the KZ block that matches each channel. The select statement only allows one KZ block to execute, even if multiple channels are ready simultaneously. Only after executing the selected KZ block, the execution continues and the next ready channel will be read. Our code example will be simple. We will create two channels or more, and then we will read from them using at first go routines and then the select statement. So let's create our channels here. Both of them are going to be string channels. So we have ch1, ch2, and we will send Inside of Go routines, we will send messages to these channels using the send operator. We send a message to the first channel, 
let's copy and paste that and then we have the channel to receiving a new message we also have to read from these channels so let's create additional routines for each read operation so i will iterate the channel one in this routine and i will print the value inside of the loop okay let's do the same uh, for the second channel just change into ch2 and let's uh, block our main go routine that's it we have these first two go routine sending messages to the channels channel one and channel two respectively and we have the last two go routines receiving values from them let's run our program and see the results okay as you can see the results are okay we have the messages being printed in the console uh, but we had to have one go routine for each channel let's say that we have a third channel in this program and let's send uh create a new go routine to to send messages to this additional channel so channel three and then we will have to read from this channel in an additional go routine uh, yeah so this is pretty much working and i will introduce to you the select statement so instead of these three go routines reading from the channels we will have only one go routine inside of this go routine we will have a uh, infinity for and we will have the select statement inside of the select statement we will have the case block and each case block will listen or receive uh, messages from each channel i will just print the values inside of each case block so here we are gonna say that this message came from the channel one and we will duplicate this uh code to the other channels so we have we have three case blocks uh listening to different channels and printing the messages let's run it okay let's put a slash n here so we can create a new line after each print cool so we have the messages being printed in the console let's say that we want to create one more channel we have ch4 we will send the message to this new channel and we will uh, add this channel add a case block in the select statement for this specific channel c84 i will also add an additional case block uh, and i will use this time after function okay and this function will wait until a time duration and then it will send a message to the channel then we will print that five seconds has passed and uh, we can also uh, panic our application so we can interrupt the uh, the program after running it we will see that after five seconds the program will be interrupted okay and we have the message five seconds without messages and a panic no messages we can also add a default behavior for our select statement so in this case uh we will time sleep for some time and also print a message that we are uh we don't have message so if any other channel receive no messages this behavior will be reproduced and after five seconds we should see the interruption which we are not seeing 
okay uh so as as the default behavior is here we are every time that we are passing in the time after function uh because the time after function is based on the time now so it's res uh, restarting the clock every time so uh, we can create a variable and uh, assign this time after value to this variable instead of calling it every time uh, in the case block. So I will create this timeout variable and I will put this timeout. Uh, this is a channel in the case block. Okay, receive operator. Okay. Yeah, let's run again. So now we should see uh, the interruption after five seconds. Okay, uh, so it it's working fine. It's important to mention that the select statement only allows one KZ block to execute at a time, even if multiple channels are ready simultaneously. That's it for the select statement class and see you in the next class. In this class, we are going to review some of the concepts that we've learned so far. The idea is to develop a web crawler that will be able to make HTTP requests and handle its responses. In this example, we will use GoRoutines, mutexes, weight groups, channels, select statements, and atomic operations. It is important to say that this is an extra class. So, if you feel already comfortable with the subjects I mentioned, you can move on to the next one. But if you think that it's worth it to see again these topics, then let's go. To begin with our application, I will create a list of URLs that we are going to request. So, I will put here google.com. Also, open AI and we'll put a third option uh, unreachable or a not 200 response URL let's keep it Google with not found uh, path now that we have the list of URLs we are going to iterate them using the for loop statement so inside of this loop we are going to uh, use the http package and we are going to call the get method passing the url we get back the response and the error and we are going to check if the error uh, happened or not let's just print it at first okay slash n okay and i will uh, continue in the loop so we interrupt this uh, iteration. Also, when it comes to HTTP requests, we have to close the body in the end of the function. So we are using defer and we will print uh, a successful message before returning. Yeah, I will print only the status code. And it looks like we are missing the range keyword here. Okay. Uh, let's run. Okay, we got some responses here, but let's put the URL in our uh, print function so we can have a more trackable output in the console. Okay, running again, that's better, 
But this 404 here, it isn't uh, exactly a successful response. Let's, let's make it better. So I'm going to check if the response status code is different from the status OK from the HTTP package. If it is different, I'm going to print it as an error. Better saying, uh, maybe it is not an error, but a non-successful response. Let's change it here. So this is a non-success. Okay, let's run. I forgot something. Ah, okay. I don't have error here, so I will just print the response code. Cool, let's run again. Yeah, now we see the 404 as a non-successful response. That's better. And let's add one more URL here in order to make an error happen. Okay, running again the code. Now we see a message, an error message saying that no such host in the non-existent URL.com. Now that we have a basic example of the application running, we are going to improve it using the tools that we've learned. So let's go. Our first improvement here is to uh, separate this section of code in a different function. Let's call this new function uh, fetch URL. It's gonna get the URL as a string and it will be the same we were doing in the iteration, except that we have to return to interrupt the function and that's it. Now we have to call this function from the main go routine and we are going to use go routines here so we can make a lot of requests asynchronously. Let's run this and see the behavior. This is a expected behavior. We've seen that. We have to give enough time to the go routines to finish. The way we do that is using wait groups. Let's add to our wait groups the number of URLs that we have. And let's mark uh, the wait groups as done in the end of the fetch URL function. What am I missing? Okay, I have to add the wait in the end of the main go routine. Running again. Now we got it. We have the results, everything is working, and we are using GoRoutines, wait groups, and that's it. Let's evolve a little more our example. Instead of printing as we are doing here in this function, let's send these messages to channels. So I will create two channels, a success channel that will be a string channel and also a failures channel. Also a string. I will initiate these two channels in the beginning of the main function because we have to use the make function when it comes to channels. And instead of printing the messages in the fetch URL function, I will send messages to these channels. So here I will send the message to the failures channel using the send operator. And here is also a failure. But if the response code is uh, 200, I will send it to the success channel. I think that's it. Let's run our code.
So what is happening here? The problem is that we have the failures and successes channels and we are only sending message to them and both of them are unbuffered channels. So what happens when we send messages to unbuffered channels and we don't have go routines listening or uh, receiving these messages? They are blocked. I will create them a select statement in order to receive these messages from the channels. Uh, we have this structure, just go routine with a for inside of it. And then we have the select statement with the cases. We are going to have two case blocks here. We are going to have the failure case block. And at first I will just print the messages. And we will also have the success case block. So it's going to receive the successes channel using the receive operator. And I will just print it. OK. I think that's it. Let's run our code and see the results. As you can see, we should have four URLs being printed, but we have only three. And this is happening because this weight group done will have to be moved to the select statement because here is the end of the whole operation right now. So we want the weight group to be done only after it's being printed. Let's take another look at the results. Now we got it, it's working again. We have the same results as before, but at this point we are using uh, channels to send messages and we are using the select statement to receive these messages and printing them. Okay, let's uh, enhance a little more our example. At this point we are sending messages to string channels but we can have more complex types as channels. So let's create a struct here called response and let's add some fields. We are gonna have URL, code, and also a message. Now, instead of uh, creating a channel of string, we are gonna change these channels for the response type make also and we will change the fetch URL function and we are gonna send a response to the channels uh, so I will send the URL the code here we don't have the code because we don't have response here so we don't have the code let's keep it blank and uh, I will say I will send the error message here here in the failure when the status code is different from uh, 200 i will send uh, the code that is coming status code and i will uh, send the status message here uh, okay i will do the same in the success uh, except that we are sending to the successes and not to the failures channel Okay, we don't have to change anything in the select statement. Looking good, let's run and see the results. Okay, we were using the print function in the select. Let's change it to the println so we can, uh, we can see a better result. Okay, yeah, we have the same results as before, except that we are seeing uh, it more structured. This time, because we are sending the URL, the code, and the status, or the error message. Uh, and we are printing it. Okay, let's move on. Now that we have structured messages being sent to the channels, we can use it and implement some logic. 
I will create a new type called summarized response here. In this uh, new struct, we will add two fields. We will have the code and the number of occurrences. So the idea here is to have a summary report of the number of occurrences that each code had. We will have a variable that will be a slice of summarized response. Okay, uh, now we can create a function that will implement our logic and uh, make this summarized responses uh, report. So this function will uh, receive as a parameter uh, response, which is the structure that our channels uh, are receiving. And we are going to do a logic here. Basically, uh, at first I will just append to the uh, slice of responses, the summarized responses. I will append the response and I will inform the code of the response and the number of occurrences. Uh, it will start with one, and then we will have to uh, iterate these uh, responses, the summarized responses. We are going to iterate it to increment the occurrences when it happened again. So basically I will iterate the some wraps variable and I will check if the response code that's coming it, it's already in the slice so if it's already in the slice I will only increment the occurrences and I will return and if it isn't it will end the iteration and add one uh, to the slice a very important point here is that we are using a shared resource, so we need a mutex to make sure that we are uh, changing uh, the shared resource properly. So we lock and we unlock in the end of the function, for, or before returning, better saying. Okay, uh, let's now call this function in our select statement, in our case blocks passing uh, along the response. It will be the same. And that's it. Uh, before the end of the program, we will print our summarized responses. So we let's iterate this and print uh, each result. Yeah, so let's say here this is a uh, results by code. Okay, uh, let's run our program and see the, the results. Okay, as you can see, uh, we have two, two hundred, one, zero, that's an error, and we have a 404. So we have this summary of what happened in the whole application. I will add a few more URLs here so we can make sure that our report is working. As you can see, it's fully working. And that's it. Let's go ahead and keep improving our application. The last piece of improvement in our application will be atomic operations. We are going to create a new struct. We will call it app statistics. Statistics. And at first we will have only two fields. The uh, success responses. That will be a atomic integer 64 and also the failures responses that will be also a atomic 64 
now that we have the struct in place, we will uh, create a variable and initiate the app statistics struct. Now in the select case blocks, we increment or add one to these atomic operations. The failure case block also. Okay, add one. And we will also print some uh, results in the end of the code. Let's say here statistics. And we are going to use the load function from the atomic variables to load the values from them. So here we will have the successes. And we will also have the failures. Okay, let's run it. Cool, so we have in the end of the console, we have the, after the results, we have the statistics. And it's saying that we have two successes and two failures. We are gonna add a few more statistics to our application. One of them will be the idle time of the application. During this time, we have nothing happening. So in this default function, we will implement this logic. The idle time logic. So we will have a start time here in the beginning of the for. That's gonna be time dot now. And we are gonna use the function uh, sense from the time package to measure uh, how much time has passed during this interval. We want this uh, time to be in microseconds so we can be as precise as possible. Uh, and we add this to a new variable, idle time. And then we will uh, increment this time in our app statistics uh, struct. Uh, let's add the field first. So idle time, we will also add this as atomic integer 64. And then we can add the idle time variable to this atomic operation. Okay, uh, let's also print it in the end of the program. So this is going to be the idle time. And let's run our program. Cool, we have, yeah, this is in micro, uh, microseconds. Let's uh, make it a second uh, variable. Second, and let's see again. Okay, we will need this to be a float 64, so we can see decimals in the console. Okay, now we have uh, in seconds uh, the amount of time that was that the application was idle, which is very little time, but yeah, this is a good statistics to have. Let's keep adding uh, some more statistics. I uh, would like to have here in the fetch URL function the amount of time of each request. So I will implement it the same way we did in the select, but this time we are uh, deferring the calculation of the sense function to the end of the function. Uh, cool, microseconds also, and let's add a new 
field in our statistics struct. It's going to be called request time. Also, atomic key integer 64. And we got a problem uh, because this app stats variable is not reachable in the fetch URL of function. So make it a global variable. And then it's going to be reachable from here. Let's so use the add operation to add the uh, request time to the variable. Let's also print this one. Request time. Perfect. Request time. Yeah, I will also add one more statistics variable to our uh, struct. And this one is going to collect the total time of the application. Same logic, we are going to add a start time variable in the beginning of the main function. And we will calculate it after the wait. So using the time since function. And then adding the result to the app statistics, app statistics variable using a add atomic operation. Okay, uh, it's gonna be microseconds also. And we will also print it in the end of the app. Cool, let's run. Mm, yeah, uh, yeah, I forgot to change this variable to app total time. Okay, let's run. So now we have the idle time, the request time, uh, which is uh, less than uh, one second, and we have the total time that's less either. It's very interesting to mention here that uh, the app total time is less than the request time, and this is happening because we are using Go routines and we are taking advantage of the concurrency tools of the language. So if we were going to do request by request, it would take more than the whole application is taking right now. For the final test of our application, I made a list of 100 requests. We are going to call them and see how the application will behave. So let's replace this for the get URL function and let's run the program. So as you can see, we have some results here, like we have 11, 203, we have 85, 200, three times 429 ATTP code. Let's double check it. So we have, yeah, three requests uh, with the too many requests code. And we have one error. Uh, that's the Twitter right here. Okay. Then we have the statistics and we have 85 successes, 15 failures. The idle time was almost nothing. And remember, this is the time that the select was not receiving uh, messages from the channels. The request time was 61 seconds and the app total time was one, almost two. Uh, so this means that it would take more than one minute to this application to run if we were not using any concurrency tools. Running again, so yeah, this time we have uh, different variables, but yeah, uh, similar results, yeah. So that's it for the review class, I hope you enjoyed it, and see you in the next class. In this class, we are going to talk about the data race detector, but first we have to understand what a data race is. 
A data race occurs when multiple parts of a Go program access the same data simultaneously, with at least one of them performing a write operation. This lack of proper coordination can lead to unpredictable behavior and bugs that are hard to identify. To help developers detect and fix data races, Go provides a built-in tool called the Data Race Detector. The Data Race Detector is enabled using the dash race when running a Go program. When enabled, it monitors the memory accesses of running Go routines and detects when there is a potential data race. If a data race is detected, it prints a warning message to the standard output indicating the location in the code where the data race occurred. To exemplify the use of the data race detector, we are going to create a very simple example. We will have this data variable, and we are going to change this variable inside of a Go routine. We are going to assign the 42 value to the variable, and then we are going to read from uh, the same variable. In this case, I will be printing in the console. Okay. Let's also block our main Go routine so we can give enough time to the Go routines to finish. Now, we are not using mutex or atomic operations here, but yeah, let's run and see the results. So it looks like it's working fine. But when we run it using the dash race in the command line, we'll see the problem. Yeah, so we have this error in the console. Let's take a look at it. So we have this read. We have this warning data race and we have this read in the line 14, which is the println function. And we also have this write uh, happening in the line 10. So they are uh, trying to change the shared resource concurrently. We also have the go routine number and uh, the line that they are declared. So we have here line 13 and line nine we can find not only the line that's causing the problem but also the go routine we have several ways to solve this problem uh, we can use atomic operations as we have already seen so we add value to the variable and we load and running again we will not see the error in the console And another way to solve this would be using uh, mutexes. So instead of using atomic operations, we can declare a mutex variable. And we can lock and unlock uh, every time that we are changing or reading the variable. That should work the same way. Yeah and it works fine. To demonstrate a little more about the data race detector, I brought back this example from the condition variables class. Let's read this code to recap what this is doing. So basically we have these two functions, producer and consumer, and they are incrementing and decrementing the variable counter. We are using mutex and also condition variables. So after the producer increment the variable, it sends a message to the consumer, which decrements and sends a message to the producer and so on. Uh, let's run this. So here we have incrementing and then decrementing. Uh, and this is going to be for five seconds working this way. Let's then remove the mutex and the condition variables from our code and see what happened. Okay. Okay, let's run the code. 
as you can notice, we don't have the correct behavior anymore because we don't we are not using any kind of synchronization mutex, for example, and we also don't see any error in the console. Now, using the race detector, we are going to see a lot of uh, errors. Let's wait until the end of the execution and then let's read this console. Okay, uh, we have six data races uh, found. The first one is this one. We have a data race in the line 44, which is the decrementing action. And then we see that we have in the line 29 the incrementing action. So one is racing against each other. Uh, and we have the go routines lines that will be always 15 and 16 here in the beginning of the main function. Uh, in the second warning, uh, we have a different line, line 40, which is the uh, if of the consumer, and it is racing against the line 30, which is the print function. After this, we will have the line 44 again, uh, decrementing and racing against the 29. Okay, that's it. Uh, I wanted to show you that the data race detector can provide a very detailed report on which uh, part of the code is racing against other. We also have learned that the data race detector will not stop the execution of the program but it will be logging the warnings during the execution of the program. So that's it for the data race detector class. Hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next class. In this class, we are going to talk about contexts. The context package is used to manage the life cycle of operations within a concurrent program. It is especially helpful in scenarios where multiple goal routines are working together to accomplish a task and you need to ensure proper coordination to avoid resource leaks or unnecessary waiting. The context patch provides a context type, which holds information about the context of an operation and facilitates communication and synchronization between different parts of a program. Each context instance can have a parent context, forming a hierarchical tree-like structure. When a context is cancelled or times out, all its child contexts are also cancelled automatically. Imagine that we have a main Go routine with a function. We are going to create few Go routines that we'll call this function. When creating these Go routines, we will pass along a context. We will see that this context can be of the following types with cancel, with cancel calls, with timeout, with deadline, and with value. In the next code examples, I will show you how to use each of these contexts. Let's go. In this first example, we are going to create a function called worker. And we will receive an integer parameter called id. Inside of this function, we will have this for and we will print a message. Okay, let's use the print function here. Cool. And let's also uh, sleep a little in this iteration. Okay. In the main go routine, I will call this worker function twice, passing different ID parameters. And I will also wait in the main go routine so we can watch what is happening. Yeah, let's run. Okay, I forgot about the slash n here. Now we can see in the console the worker one and two working and printing message each second. Let's introduce the use of contexts in this example. I will first create a root context and we will use 
as the base context, the background context. I will create an additional parameter in the worker function. And this is going to be a context interface, uh, which means that we can send here, we can pass here any kind of context. Now I will pass the root context in the go routines. But this is not changing anything in terms of behavior. So I will create a new context using the context package called with cancel. In this with cancel function, we have to pass a parent context. As you can see, we are going to use the root context. Now, this function will return two values, the context itself and a cancel function. So we will attribute these values to two new variables. We are going to pass this new context to the worker go routines. And we are going to use this cancel function uh, to cancel the context where it's being used. So in order to exemplify this, uh, I will create in the worker function, I will create a select statement. In this select, we will have two case blocks. The first one will be the context dawn channel, which is provided by the context interface. So here we will print a message saying that the go routine is finished. So let's change this a little. So worker ID, context canceled with error. And then it's exiting. Okay, we have to pass the error as a parameter. And we are going to get the error also from the context. Okay, uh, we have to return after the case block. And we will have a default case block, which will be the time sleep with the message that the worker is working. Okay, now this context.don channel will be triggered only when the cancel function uh, will be called. So we will create a new anonymous go routine and we are going to pass the cancel function as a parameter here. So we will use the context package and cancel func. Okay, uh, here we will wait a little, let's say four seconds, and then we will cancel call, actually, the cancel function, which will send a message to the context on channel. Running this program, we notice that after four seconds, we have an interruption. A brief review of what is happening here. We have called the cancel function, which will cancel the context uh, and trigger the dawn channel. We are also printing the error message from the context, which is the context cancel message in the console. And that's it. Let's go ahead and see our next example. In this example, we are going to use the with cancel cause function. So let's change here to with cancel cause and let's read this uh, docs. So here we have now a cancel cause function and we have to pass an error to it 
and we can capture this error using the context package and the cause function passing the context. Uh, here it's complaining because now we don't have a cancel function, but a cancel cause function. And we have to pass an error when calling it. So let's change here and let's create a, a error on the errors package. I'm going to call it error x. And then we have to change the, the capture of the error here. So we will use the context package and we use the cause function passing the context. So this should return the error that canceled the context. Yeah, that's it. Let's run this example. Okay, let's wait a little. As we can see, we have the error X as the reason why the context was canceled. This can be very helpful when it comes to why the application stopped running. Let's go for our next example. Right now, we are using this uh, anonymous goroutine uh, to sleep for four seconds, and then we are uh, canceling the context. There's a better way to do that, and it's using uh, with timeout context. So instead of with cancel calls, we are going to replace this for with timeout. And we have to pass a second parameter, which will be the time duration that we want to wait. That's going to be five seconds. And then it's going to return uh, the context and also a cancel function. So interesting thing here is that it's a good practice to always uh, defer to the cancel function after the creation of the context. So in our example, we want the timeout to happen, and then we will see the uh, context deadline is seeded in a message. Let's wait. And there it is. This means that the context reached uh, the timeout. Uh, and this is the cause, context deadline is seeded. Uh, one interesting thing to notice here is that we could cancel this context instead of waiting until the timeout. So let's call the cancel function here and better. Let's wait one second and then cancel the context. We have a different message in the console, context canceled. And yeah, this is just to demonstrate that uh, the context will be canceled uh, one way or another are canceling the function or waiting for the timeout. So I will remove this cancel function from our code just to make it as simple as possible. Okay, we have again the context deadline is seeded and that's it for the timeout context. Let's go for the next example. In this example, we are going to use the deadline context. Uh, so I will rename this variable and then create a with deadline context. Okay, uh, the first parameter is the parent. So I will pass the timeout context here. And then the second parameter is the time that we want to wait until the context should be timed out. Uh, in this case, I will add three seconds to the now time and I will increase it this one to 10 so we will uh, see the difference in the console. Also this will return a context variable and also a cancel function which I will not use right now. I will pass this context to the second worker and that's it. So in this case, we are passing the deadline context to the second worker and passing the timeout context to the first one. So this one we wait 10 seconds and the other one we wait three seconds. Okay, let's run and see the results.
as you can see, the for the second worker was already timed out, and then the first worker was timed out after 10 seconds. So we have the root context uh, being the parent of the timeout context and the timeout context being the parent of the deadline context. This is exactly the tree-like structure that we mentioned in the beginning of this class. We are going to see some counseling order in the next example, so let's go for it. In this last example, we will demonstrate how to use the with value context. So we will use the youth value function. We pass the parent context. In this case, I will use the timeout context. And we have to pass a key. And as you can see, a key and a value, uh, which are interfaces, so we can pass whatever we want here, I will use strings. This is gonna return only the context variable. So I'm gonna assign this value to this new variable. And I will create a new anonymous function to get this value, this key, uh, from this context. So we are gonna pass the context as a parameter to this anonymous function and we will wait until the context to be done and then print a message in the console let's say here anonymous function cancelled with value and then we are going to print the value uh, that we are going to capture from the context. Yeah, context dot value, exactly. And then we pass the key that we want uh, to retrieve the value. So we have the key here. Okay, that's it. Let's, let's run and see the results. Okay, the first worker was cancelled or timed out. Then we have the message in our console, anonymous function cancelled with value, the value. Let's change this key in this function here and see what's going to happen. Again, first worker timed out. And then the other one. So we have we don't have an error, but we have this new message from the context because the key is not there. Yeah, only wanted to demonstrate how it behaves. Now it's very important to notice that the with value context was cancelled or timed out at the same time that the timeout context was. And this is happening because the timeout context is the parent of the value context. So this is a good demonstration on how the uh, tree-like and hierarchical order of the contexts will work. And this is all for the context class. I hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next class. Congratulations, you completed the course. You've gained valuable insights about the concurrent programming with Go. And I hope you feel confident in applying these skills to your projects. Remember that learning is a continuous process, so keep exploring and experimenting with the concepts you've learned. If you found the course valuable, I would greatly appreciate your feedback and a review. Stay curious and keep coding.